Welcome back to my YouTube channel everybody. For this week's video I would like to present another custom railroad design. Now some aspects of this layout design may seem a little familiar to some of my viewers. That's because I already designed one railroad for this client, but before I was able to quite finish it, the site for the railroad disappeared and plans for the home that it was meant for got completely changed. So this is a repeat design with more or less the same specifications but for a different site. Now here is the top floor of the home that the customer is building. At first I thought it was this rectangular area at the bottom labelled attic space that he was giving me for the railroad design. And although this was a nice long space, it's about 35 feet long, a lot of it is less than full headroom. Here's the section and we can see that the knee wall on the one side is only about two feet high. So fully a quarter of the space would be unavailable to the upper deck of the multi-deck layout. So we would be building a long skinny oval layout, although on the plus side, this area along the south wall would have been a fantastic location for a big staging yard on the lowest level. But after that aside, that turned out to not be the room that he wanted the layout design for. It is the squarish room over his garage that is marked on the plan as a bedroom. Now it is a little over 20 feet square, plus this little extra bit, giving a few extra feet of length over this area. Now here is the cross section for this room. As we can see, it's a room in attic truss. So we have knee walls and they're marked here on the plan as four foot 10 and a half inches. Now, when I went with the plan, I chose to assume that these dimensions he's given me are the truss sizes rather than the room size. So just to be on the safe side, I've taken one inch off the width and one and a half inches off the height to allow for drywall and flooring. And also we can see that the ceiling height is a little lower than normal. It's only around seven foot nine inches. I'll talk more about that later because it did have some bearing on the design. Anyway, the requirement is for a double track continuous main line on two decks. And here is the layout footprint that I came up with after a couple of false starts. I think this is about the third one that I thought of. Originally, I wasn't quite sure whether the room was going to be quite wide enough to get the double deck layout with a central peninsula and the double track main line with the required 30 inch minimum on the inside track. The shaded rectangles at the side are the estimated area that can't be used for the upper deck. Although there's plenty of room for it, we might be restricted on the width somewhat on that top deck. And also at this point, we're still thinking of fairly wide aisles. The previous layout that I drew for him had four foot wide aisles. And I drew a four foot along the back and three and a half feet in the front. But then he said he was okay with dropping the aisles to three feet throughout. So that gave us enough space for the design to work. I've turned it around horizontally here because it fitted the screen better. So north is now to the side. And I've drawn this cross section of the room just to work out exactly how much space we have to leave for the sides. And based on a 60 inch nominal track elevation for the upper deck, these shaded rectangles now take away everything that is less than five foot six inches tall. So allowing six inches at the back edge of the bench work, enough for about a three story building or a reasonable tree line. And then where the helix is coming down, we're already going to be down at least two inches by the time we get to the back. So we can actually go a little bit further out. And that second mark along here was just calculating how far I can go without running afoul of the sloped roof. Now this drawing shows a double-sided backdrop down the middle of the room. And remember I said that the ceiling is a little lower than normal. We eventually decided to get rid of the backdrop and instead replace it with a row of structures reaching slightly above eye level to use as a view block. That way keeping the whole ceiling area open and lessening the possibility of the room feeling claustrophobic. So this is how I proposed to route the main line on the upper deck. The lower deck is intended to be a series of dioramas. And you may recall the previous layout that I designed for this customer. I will put a link in the description below just in case you want to go back and refresh your memory. And basically this is a larger version of that same layout. So here is the lower level, the diorama level. 
and schematically it's identical to what we had before with this junction along the wall opposite the two helixes and a single track branch line heading down to a staging level but in this case instead of having the staging yard across under the helixes both approach tracks will wrap around underneath their respective helix and turn back on themselves so that the staging yard will be directly underneath the junction but about a foot lower down and then in this corner behind the door there is room for a workbench yes i could put an industrial complex in there but the workbench gives better use of the space and under the upper deck bench work on the other side in this triangle behind the helix that's not otherwise usable there is plenty of space for a spray booth and this wall along here is an outside wall so it's very easy to vent it with a flexible dryer pipe under the helix to the outside. Here is the first iteration of what I drew for the staging level, although the routing did later change somewhat, as I wanted to get the turnouts to the front edge of the benchwork. Here is another version of the main level. Now here what I've done is moved the main yard from the back side of the room to the front aisle. It's a little bit shorter, but it does have the advantage that I can go full width and it also puts it right at one end of the upper deck. This made it possible to create a branch line from the main yard around the outside of the room and around the peninsula to an industrial town, giving quite a worthwhile end-to-end -end run. The main reason for wanting to do this is that there is virtually no operation on the lower level. It's just open running through scenery. So all his actual operation is going to be confined to the top deck. So this gives us a worthwhile point-to-point -point layout in addition to the long double track continuous main line. And there's even plenty of room for an intermediate town with a passing siding halfway along. Here is that same design in a little more detail. Here all the tracks have been hooked up with proper turnouts instead of just being drawn in approximately the right locations. I just wanted to make sure that the various alignments were possible. Now the industrial spurs are not necessarily in their final locations, but it does give a good idea of the scope available in the various towns. Now this yard area is a little twisted because I didn't want to have to bend the main yard ladder for the classification bolt around this sharp curve. That's why I offset it slightly and put it on the diagonal above the helix. Also leaving it at an angle it does make it a little more interesting than multiple tracks parallel to the fascia. And in order to leave more room to develop the yard, I moved the Amtrak station you wanted to the other side of the room. And I remember from last time when I was in California installing a model railroad in a home that overlooked an Amtrak station, I remembered that it was on a double track main line, but all the facilities seemed to be on one side only. So I checked the satellite photographs for that town and I found that there was no facilities on the other side of the main and all westbound passenger trains had to cross over to the eastbound main to make the station stop. And also I noticed that there was several miles between the crossovers, requiring a fairly lengthy run on the wrong main. So that's why I accepted the fact that this crossover was quite a long way out and put another one on the curb at this end. I could have got it on the straight, but the customer had four of the largest radius of Walther's turnouts that he asked me to use if possible. So I was able to use two of them there and two in an identical location at the top of the helix. So the arrangement of this Amtrak station here is totally prototypical. And there is plenty of room for it here. I can have a decent sized building and the start of a parking lot in front of it as well, instead of trying to cram it in where there really is no space in front of the yard. Anyway, at this point, I left the customer to mull over the upper deck design and I went to work on the diorama level here it is divided up with just four large dioramas, one for each of the four seasons. On the previous layout, the shape of the room meant that I had to break it up a lot more. And although that did actually make supporting the upper deck somewhat easier, it's a lot less broken up in this version. Although at the expense of requiring me to get inventive when it comes to the structure of the upper deck. If you recall, the upper deck is a nominal height of 60 inches and the knee walls are slightly below that. So here are two methods that I thought of. One is to put the wall brackets right at the top of the wall and have the frame come forward a little bit. And the other method was to create strong C girders with vertical sheets of three quarter inch plywood sandwiching the joists. 
I've shown two such joists on this wall under the main yard and three on the slightly longer wall. Although I eventually reduced it to two because at this point we have a backdrop coming forward and there could be a post in there. Now if you compare this to the plan that I drew more than a year ago for the other space, you can see how all the same elements have been included, but they've been spread out just a little bit more since the room is about 50% larger. Here is the staging yard drawn out properly. See, I have brought the main lines forward so that all the turnouts can be along the front edge of the bench where they're easy to reach. And by making one extra lap under this helix, both approach routes end up exactly the same length and long enough to gain 12 inches of vertical separation with a 2% grade. Although during later discussion with the client, we decided that it would be beneficial to make one additional lap under each helix and have about 16 inches of separation, making it a lot easier to access the staging yard. It also gave me better clearance under this diorama here where I wanted to have a deep valley. Here is the completed diorama level. While I was filling in this, I did have the approach track to the staging yard drawn in so I could see exactly where it was. There is plenty of room for the stream to cross over the top of that track and then drop down over a series of waterfalls so that the trestle can be really tall at the front. And the plan is to use the microengineering 210 foot trestle, maybe with one extra span, but definitely with the tower extensions under the two central towers. And then we'll have the valley probably about 18 inches below track level at the front. I did add one switching area on the lower level. There's a pulpwood spur in the spring diorama because there was plenty of room for it. And also pulpwood loads are really cool and the customer has several bulkhead flats that could be used for this traffic. There was one other thing that the customer asked for to be included in this design that wasn't in the previous one. That was a short section of freeway. I think he mentioned the I-52, although it might not be. It might have been a different freeway. But here it is crossing over the railroad in the winter diorama, giving an opportunity to demonstrate the method of ploughing snow in the UP with four or five snow ploughs in a diagonal line across the road. And it turns out he already has five snow plan models, which is perfect. We have four on this freeway bridge and one passing in front of the house where it has just buried the gentleman's driveway immediately after he finished snow blowing. One thing that I did struggle with somewhat on this version of the summer diorama was the airport. If you recall in the previous one, I had a convenient location where it could run diagonally across the corner with both ends of the runway disappearing into trees. Here, I didn't have that option. So the customer and I discussed possibilities and we came up with the idea of putting a big loop in the backdrop at this point and building the runway in forced perspective. Now it's a long reach into here, far too far to be able to detail it in situ. So the airport will simply be built on a two inch plank of foam and then inserted as a completed diorama. The backdrop will just have to be painted first. And then the small town scene in the four diorama it's pretty much the same as the previous layout, although it's been straightened out somewhat. If you recall before, it was bent around the end of a 180 degree curve. The only thing we've lost on the lower level is the trucking terminal that was in the winter diorama. But there is now plenty of space for additional industries on the upper deck, where operation will be a lot more comfortable anyway. Now, at some point while I was working on this level, the customer informed me that he had around 50 really short hopper cars. And he was thinking they were the 22 for all cars. So I came up with the idea of adding the Walther's ore dock on a small section of bench work over the top of his workbench. There wasn't enough space here for a full size four track ore dock, but it would have been just about right for the Walther's kit, pretty much unmodified. Although this version was short lived, as the client then dug through his storeroom again and discovered that they weren't ore cars. They were the short two bay coal hoppers. So we just scrubbed the idea of the ore dock and allowed this area behind the workbench to be used for parts and tool storage, giving him a much better work area. So at this point, I started filling in some of the details. You can see that some industries and trees put in around this area over the first helix. But I was looking at this work area. If you recall, there's a workbench in this corner and a spray booth the other side. Let's go back to the lower deck where we can see it better. Okay, so we've got the workbench 
in this corner and the spray booth the other side of the door, which is fine as long as the door remains closed. If he decides he wants to work with the door open, it's going to be in the way. Or if his wife comes barging in while he's working, she might hit him in the butt with the door. So I thought about the possibility of trading it for a pocket door. And you'll see on some of the later designs, it's redrawn with a sliding door in this location. The client responded that he's not particularly keen on sliding doors and he might have it open outwards instead. But that's something that doesn't have to be decided until the room's built. So let's get back to the main thread. The other thing that I was thinking while filling in these details is the shape of the yard and why I had the classification bowl facing in this direction. And that's because I was thinking that the yard lead at this end wouldn't really be long enough to put the classification yard along behind the arrival departure tracks. But then I was thinking that it can be longer because it doesn't have to stop short of the road bridge. Although the main line is on a falling grade into the helix, the yard lead can stay level, cross under the road, and it can wrap three quarters of the way around the first lap of the helix, making it plenty long enough. It can go all the way around through the backdrop once and stop just short of where it would reappear through the backdrop a second time. So that makes that yard lead plenty long enough to turn the classification bowl around. So I drew another version with it facing the other way. Here it is. Now with the classification yard in this location, each track is slightly shorter than it was before I moved it, but I've drawn six tracks here instead of five. So the overall yard capacity is about the same. Now with the geometry of the turnouts that I used for the ladder, I ended up with a slightly larger gap than necessary behind the AD tracks. So I realigned all the tracks in the front and then moved the entire yard forward a couple of inches, allowing space for an extra industrial spur behind this long tail track. And that greatly improved the situation with switching the industries in this area. Now I did a lot more twisting and cutting here because I felt there was enough room for a team track and a freight house in this area if I could just make maximum use of this space. So after a little bit of juggling, this is what I came up with. It's still the same space, but I was able to make better use of it. And not only did we get a team track and a freight house, but I also had a short spur in the middle with a trailer ramp. Now this is fairly early in the diesel era where it would have been a 50 foot flat car with a single trailer rather than an 89 footer with two trailers. And those were generally loaded circus style at end ramps instead of from the side with a crane, as is the modern method. As you can see, I have a good variety of industries and I also started filling in the other town as well. Now at this point, I sent it off to the customer one more time to get some feedback. I wanted to make sure that I was heading in the right direction before I spent the time to fill in all the details. But it came back that he really loved what I was doing. He liked the variety of industries that I'd included on the peninsula. And he asked me to go ahead and finish it. So that's what I did. Here is the upper deck finished. This area hasn't changed from the previous plan. It's just got the scenery drawn in. Note how the benchwork comes forward in front of the window to allow for blinds or drapes or whatever other window treatment he wants to put in and the backdrop just stops short of the window either side, allowing him to keep the natural light in the room. In front of the window, I have shown a row of tall chemical storage tanks over part of the length and a tree line the rest of the way, just to give some kind of realistic background to the trains rather than the out of scale curtains. This next scene came about after earlier discussion with the client and he asked for a second set of freeway on the upper deck that wasn't gonna be snow covered he liked the idea of a state trooper hiding in the median behind the bridge abutment, waiting to give out some superb driving awards. And we could even duplicate a meme I once saw with a sign beside the road, warning highway patrol by aircraft, and then a military attack helicopter hiding behind it. Here is the Amtrak station shown with a parking lot included, a tree line between the two separate routes just to break the association between them. The branch line is not necessarily going to draw attention to itself unless there's a train on it. I've shown three industries at the intermediate town and note how this industry here is a large complex, which when seen from the other side represents a completely different industry in a different town served by a different spur. And all these structures along the center also represent different structures in two different towns, depending on which side you view them from. Only the one at the end needs to be full depth. Everything else can be much thinner. 
and the idea is to have these built slightly above the customer's eye level so that the subterfuge is not readily apparent. I've drawn the main line splitting to go through two single track trusses at this point. That's because the client found two single track Walther's truss bridges in his supply. We later talked about it and he said he would rather have a single double track bridge. And my thoughts are that ultimately I can probably use the two singles on my own layout. So I'm just gonna buy him a double track truss and exchange it for the two singles. Here's another scene that we talked about, a residential street just cutting across the corner at the front with some homes behind it. It has a lot of small town buildings, including some residences, which might not fit in the town in the diorama below. Since the second bridge is on a curve, it will have to be short spans with a pier in the middle. And then we disappear from the upper deck and head to the second helix. Now, when I last discussed track elevation with the customer, I mentioned that the higher we can build this town on the branch line, the better it will be for the dividing structures. And I suggested going up to about 64 or 65 inches. And he got a tape out, stood it on the floor and said, yes, that'd be great. He likes the idea of this town being almost at eye level. And that works well, because with a double deck layout, I don't want to have the scenery go too far below grade. If we recall, the main track level is at 60 inches. And I'm thinking at this point, we could have both routes climb. So we can be at about 61 and a half inches at this road bridge, meaning that I don't need to cut too far into the frames. And I'll go to 62 inches at the Amtrak station. Probably only 61 and a half on the branch line, so it's slightly below instead of slightly above. The reason for that is that around this curve, where I've got the mouse now, the main line has to cross under itself on its way to the helix. So between here and back again, it's got to drop four inches. So by having the main line at around 62 to 62 and a half inches at this point, I can then drop back to the 60 inch elevation and still have a few scale feet of clearance over the river without cutting too far into the frame. And I'll still have plenty of clearance underneath the main line as I enter the helix. And then it'll drop another inch between this point and where it has to cross under the branch line. So that is not quite so critical. But with this tunnel being back to about 60 inches, the ideal height scenically for the branch line above it is about 65. It also means that we end up with a good depth of fascia to be able to hang the controls on. It's gonna be a little cramped underneath the main yard. Although if you recall, there is a fairly deep valley on the diorama in front of it. So maybe we can cut the headroom on that diorama slightly. Also in this town, I've shown how we can have a large industry in this corner served by five tracks, one serving its own power plant, two disappearing into buildings and two of them down the alleyway between the buildings. And all four of those tracks can disappear through the backdrop over the top of the helix, providing a lot more storage capacity allowing for more flexibility of operation. And also the presence of this large industry here justifies the presence of the branch line. And overall, we now have plenty of switching at each end. So just on this one deck, we have the potential for an in-depth operating session for three train crews, one switching each town and another one running trains between them. And all the time, two other trains can circle on the main line, occasionally passing through the scene. So I think that pretty much concludes this layout design. It's not the last you're going to see of this project, as we are well along in negotiations to have me build the layout for him, or at least the bench work and track, leaving him to finish the scenery and structures himself. So I will just leave you with one last look at the diorama level. And I will sign off here. Hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope to see you again next week. Thanks for watching. And bye for now.